Friends, it is a blessing to be with you on this morning. I am Reverend Ashley D. Tarbert, and our scripture today is from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 through 48. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Well, in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. He said to them, have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, let us take a moment just to pause and take in the word before our sermon. Friends, I am a strong believer that the better you get to know someone, the easier it is to hear and understand them. And so, with that in mind, here are a few things about me so that you can more easily understand the message that I'm about to deliver. I'm a Presbyterian minister who has been ordained for over three years, but has been working in ministry for over 12. I live in New York City with my wife, who is a Unitarian minister, but originally I am from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and my hometown never leaves my heart. My favorite food is macaroni and cheese. My favorite color is lavender purple. My favorite sport used to be football, but now it's women's basketball. My favorite book, probably Huck Finn and my favorite book in the Bible is Jonah. I love Jonah. I love it as a book. I love Jonah as a character. I love Jonah so much. I have a tattoo. He's grumpy. He's grouchy. He's conflicted. He's defiant. He's human. He's a very, very human prophet. He's himself. And I love that because it makes me feel okay that I'm myself. Like God can use me just as I am. Okay, so now that you've gotten to know me a little bit, I'm going to guess that you've probably got a question for me. Hey, Ashley, why are you talking about Jonah? Didn't you just read a passage from the Gospel of Luke? Haha. I see you're paying attention. To answer that question, I've been talking about Jonah and I'm done. I'm stopping because I'm introducing myself and he's important to me, but also because it sets up the chance to talk about you, to talk about us. We have something very important in common with Jonah. We have something very important in common with pretty much all the prophets and so the disciples 
Uh, and it's a thing that our text makes plain today. And that is this. We are all witnesses. The question is, what does that mean? Let's take it back. Our passage today falls towards the end of Luke 24. So let's take it back even further. Luke 24 begins with the story of the resurrection. In this version, when Jesus dies, it says, the women who had come with him from Galilee followed and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. Notice that it doesn't specify which women, just the women who had come with him. When we get to the resurrection, it says that they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. It's those same women. We get a few names this time. It says that Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James are there. But it also says that there are other women with them. So we have three named and who knows how many unnamed women rushing back to tell folks this good news. And what happens? Nearly nothing. A whole crowd of witnesses and nobody cares. The only person who even considers what they say for a second is Peter, who runs off to see for himself and is amazed. But that's not all that happens before we reach our passage today. A little further on, at Luke 24, 13, we have the story of the road to Emmaus. You might know it. Two men, one of them named Cleopas, are walking down the road and talking about what happened when they encounter a stranger. Now, he's not really a stranger, of course. He's really Jesus, but they don't know that. So when he asks what they're talking about, Cleopas replies, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And when Jesus asked him, What things? Cleopas says, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. He even goes on to recount the story that the women just told him, as if this stranger should have somehow known that. Saying that some of those who were with us went to the tomb, and we found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. And then they, in the story, they arrive at their destination and they invite the stranger in. And it's not until he breaks bread with them that they realize oh, it's been Jesus the whole time. And so, of course, he disappears and the two new witnesses jump up and they head back to Jerusalem. And they go tell the disciples what happened, which leads us to our passage today. The final part of this game of biblical telephone. The one we don't hear quite as often as the others. The disciples, having now heard twice about the resurrected Jesus, are standing around talking when Jesus greets them with a, peace be with you. Peace is the last thing they feel, obviously, as they are startled and scared and mistake him for a ghost. Seeing them freaking out, Jesus says, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And even with all this, 
with two different reports from a multitude of people about Jesus not being dead. Even with some of them visiting the tomb. Even with him standing there in front of them. Even after seeing the wounds in his hands and feet. These disciples, these witnesses in every sense of the word are still disbelieving. But they have wonder now. And they have joy. So that's a difference. It may not feel like a big difference to some of us, but it actually is. Fear to joy is huge. It's transformative. Meanwhile, Jesus is hungry, so they get him some fish. And as he's eating, he reminds them of what was written about him. That the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that the repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And then he says, You are witnesses of these things. So, back to our question. What does this mean? Well, it means that nothing is the same and everything is the same. Jesus is the same. He's still there. He's got a body that can be touched. He gets hungry. He can eat. The disciples are the same. They're still together. Still not totally understanding all the things that Jesus tells them. I mean, look at other parts of the Gospels. They don't totally understand everything he says. But also, everything is different. They watched him die. They've been living in fear. They legit thought they were dealing with a ghost. When they encounter him, when the travelers encountered him, even when the women have their encounter... No one recognizes what has happened. No one recognizes Jesus. He's different now. He can appear and disappear. He's still the same Jesus, but he's he's kind of on a different level of being himself now. And his disciples need special encounters to be able to follow him to it. Notice how they get them, though. In all three stories, being a witness means being present for an experience with Christ and Christ being there, ready and willing to make himself known. This is not a hidden God, not one who has to be earned through a certain set of circumstances or mastering a set of actions or secret code. This God, this transformative, transforming God, is a God who is willing to put in an effort to help us better understand. This is what they bear witness to. It means that doubt is not the enemy of faith. The women go to the tomb and they report back that Jesus is not dead and the male disciples don't believe them. Cleopas and his travel companion meet Jesus on the side of the road and they break bread with him and report that to their fellow disciples and they still don't believe them. Jesus shows up himself and greets them and shows off his wounds and the disciples still aren't sure whether or not they believe him. What do they need at this point to believe? But the thing is, it doesn't totally matter. The text doesn't judge them too harshly for their disbelief, and Jesus doesn't press them on it. Rather, he moves on. He asks them for food. And in the meanwhile, something does happen after all of these experiences. They may not have come all the way around, but that fear that they started with has been replaced with wonder. Wonder is a step. Wonder is imagination. It's, it's curiosity. It's not necessarily belief, but it could be. It, it holds the possibility for belief. And Jesus makes space for that. 
And what's more, there's joy. At a time when they are standing in fear and trembling because A, Jesus is God and there's a tra- there's a grand tradition of trembling in the presence of God. B, because they've been terrified of persecution ever since he died. And C, because they think he's a ghost. For them to qu- so quickly move into joy must have felt like a minor miracle. And in this minor miracle, in this small step, in this space of somehow still disbelief, is Jesus declaring the disciples' witnesses and opening them up. They may not be all the way there. They may not be perfect in the way that we so often want our figures of faith to be perfect. But they are there and they are enough for Christ. This is a God who is open enough to see doubt and know that there is still room for faith. This is what they bear witness to. It means that Jesus overcame hatred and violence and death, but not his humanity. The revelations of Jesus' resurrection in these stories are all relational. The women learn of his fate while literally seeking to care for his supposedly dead body. He converses with the men on the road and listens not only to their tale, but their feelings. He literally breaks bread and eats fish with his followers. He's still connecting with them even after everything that's happened. And... After everything that's happened, his scars are still there. He proves who he is not just through doing what seems impossible, but also by showing the most vulnerable part of himself. In this, he reminds of his he reminds us of his divinity and his humanity. His victory over death, yes, but Victory does not mean that there's no suffering. He succeeds in fulfilling what was written, but success is not a promise that there will not be pain. Jesus never actually promises that. Jesus promises to be with the oppressed and to help with their burdens. He promises to be with the afflicted and to to help ease but there's never a promise of a pain-free life in fact jesus says that to follow him often does lead to all kinds of pain and trouble but he also shows that it leads to something else to something beautiful and here he is the proof standing in front of them. This is what they bear witness to. And it is what we bear witness to. We are the disciples hearing the story today. We are the witnesses in this generation. We are the ones hearing what was said, what was fulfilled. We may have questions, we may have doubts, We may need to hear and see the same things over and over and over again before we even begin to understand. And that's okay. It is totally okay because we are here to bear witness to a God, to a Christ who is constantly reaching out to us, seeking to know us and be made known to us, even if we are struggling to get it. It's okay because we are built to be in relationship with each other, speaking and smiling and learning and questioning and doing all the things the humans do because our God came to earth in the form of a human. And when we do this with each other, it's like we're doing it with Jesus too. It's okay because we have a God that's open and understanding and patient and loving enough to make space for our doubt and disbelief and still be in relationship anyway. Jesus has called us not to be perfect, not to be unwavering, 
but to be witnesses, just as ourselves, just like the disciples. So go forth, knowing that you're a witness. Even if you don't feel like one, even if you're having a hard time with your faith, even if you've heard the same story over and over and over again, and it's just not clicking, Go forth knowing that you sitting there right now, hearing these words and listening for the word of God, you're a witness. Go forth knowing that you come from a long, long line of disciples who have heard the message and story of Jesus because you are enough. Amen.